Can I just say good evening and welcome to everyone, particularly our members of the public. Can I give a particular welcome to Councillor Chris Mead, our new independent. Chris, nice to see you. I have to make an announcement that this meeting is webcast, so there will be a broadcast live of this meeting. Can I ask you please to turn your mobile phones off or put them on silent? And I would beg your indulgence not to take any calls during the course of the meeting. You'll notice if anyone's coming forward to use the microphone system, and the microphone's on, the cameras automatically swing to whoever has the microphone on. So when you finish saying what you have to say, if you can turn your microphone off, that then enables someone else to turn their microphone on and contribute to the meeting. Okay, can I start with item one? and invite members to declare any interests or party living arrangements for the meeting this evening. Right. Okay. Yeah. I'm going to pay you an item on apology. Can I apologise? I will need to leave the meeting tonight by 7.15 to attend the other day's meeting. That's okay, please. Okay. Right. The apology. The apology. Councillor Gray. I'm also excited. Okay. The apologies, that's my fault. I forgot to ask, do we have any apologies? Chair, we have apologies from Councillors Cox and Bird and deputising uh, our Councillors Kathy Hodgson and Liz Gray, respectively. Thank you very much for that. Chair, can we just apologise to Councillor Cotier? Councillor Cotier as well. Okay, thank you for that, Christina. Are you happy now that we've got we've got the right to Tony sign now? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, no. Or would that be a question of two? Would that be a question of two so? Okay, item, item two, uh, the minutes. Can we have a committee to agree the accuracy of the minutes of the previous committee meetings? Everyone in agreement? Yeah, thank you. Okay, it's my intention to jig the agenda slightly and take item four. So our next item of business, that's the overview of the tradeways and enforcement. Uh, so I'm bringing this item forward and take item three when this is finished. Can I invite Mark Smith, one of our officers, to make a statement on item four? Thank you, Mark. Okay, thank, thank you, Chair. Good evening, members. So, um, we, we, were due to, uh, we were due to give a presentation on uh, an update on trade waste enforcement this evening, as, as you're all aware, and that was a set item on the agenda. Um, however, uh, in the last week, uh, many of you will have seen the, the publicity, certainly, and be aware that the council has made the decision um, by, uh, by mutual consent with, uh, with Kingdom to um, terminate our contract for environmental enforcement. So importantly, um, trade waste is obviously an issue that was enforced via the, uh, the Kingdom contract. So um, it won't be possible or appropriate, we would suggest, to actually give an update in that way here, uh, now, that, now that that's taken place. It's also important to draw attention as well that 
you, you obviously had a special meeting of the committee on the 15th of January, and at that meeting you had a very lengthy debate and talked about a dog control PSPO and the arguments for and against that. And a resolution was made around that. And also, uh, a such a PSPO um, would, would also, uh, if it had been perceived, would also have been subject to enforcement by the human contract as well. So, we're bringing a number of these issues together now. I think, process-wise, it will be important to share with, with yours and with members' permission. What I'd like to do is to just draw out some of the key points from the decision report from uh, from the cabinet members uh, report from last week, uh, and also just to uh, cover the um, really the, you know, the recommendations and that the decision was made because that's very much relevant to you know the business and many of the recent discussions around this committee table. Okay, by all means, Mike. Okay, thank you. So. Okay, so uh, last week then the decision was made by the Cabinet Member for Environment was to give all 42 officers to terminate that contract by mutual consent. Quoting some aspects from that decision report, um, the Council adopted the current policy on environmental enforcement and education back in March of 2016. It is this policy that Kingdom was contracted to enforce on an open, zero-tolerance approach. This contract, delivered by Kingdom, until now, as we've said, will be terminated by mutual consent. For at least an interim period, therefore, there will be no enforcement of these Council's policies previously allocated to them. It is proposed that the Council desists from reintroducing enforcement of the policy until it has been fully and completely reviewed. The Council's approach to driving behaviour change is part of the strategy to achieve the attractive local environment we will plan pledge. This will be the subject of a further review and engagement exercise in due course. It is proposed that any future policy under this pledge is only introduced following a process that ensures strong cross-community and member support. The proposed PSPO was subject to an overview and scrutiny recommendation made at the meeting on the 15th of January 2019. Any resulting PSPO was to be enforced as part of the contract by Kingdom. Given the committee's recommendation and these events, it is proposed that the PSPO is returned to overview and scrutiny and forms part of this above review. And then just finally, Chair, just to, uh, just to run through the, uh, the decision that was made by the Cabinet member. So firstly, it was to, um, uh, to give all 42 officers to agree the termination of the Council's contract with Kingdom by mutual consent. Secondly, a further report be brought to the Cabinet and or the Cabinet member concerning an interim position with regard to environmental enforcement and education. Thirdly, following extensive consultation with the public, members and the Overview and Scrutiny Committee, a further report will be brought back to the Cabinet to recommend a policy, a new policy of environmental enforcement and education. And finally, Following consideration of the PSPO proposals by Overview Scrutiny Committee on the 15th of January, the committee will be asked to do a further piece of work to consider the way forward in this regard. And just for that final point, Chair, obviously for completeness, uh, I think we know that there is an extraordinary meeting of the Council taking place on Monday evening to discuss these matters. Thank you. Okay, thanks very much, Mark. Um, my only comment would be that I'm not taking questions on that. I'm not going to give folks an opportunity to rehearse their arguments from the special council meeting. I think we'll have ample opportunity to go through the processes and there'll be more than ample opportunity for a question and answer session. So it's my intention not to take questions from members on that particular statement that's just been read out, but to move very swiftly on to the next item, which is the local plan update, and I would invite David Ball to come forward and give us an update, please, David. Thank you. Uh, just to give you a very quick update on the local plan, 
Uh, first thing to say is that the council published some of the Oh, sorry. <coughs> My apologies. Sorry. No worries, you can hear you now. Good, that, that's fine. I'll shout as well. <coughs> so, um, the council published a summary of the local plan development options consultation responses on the 28th of February, as we said we would do in the cabinet report that we sent to members on the 17th of December. Those are all now available on our website and they list all of the comments that we've received uh, from people across all of the sites uh, that we were consulting on. Uh, the council won't give any view on those comments at this stage, that will come later in the year as we develop the local plan. Uh, the second thing to say to members is that, as you recall, the Secretary of State wrote to the leave of the Council on the 28th of January with a direction that an action plan uh, for delivery of the local plan needed to be produced uh, within 10 weeks. And so the date of submission of that action plan is the 8th of April of this year. Uh, work is progressing at the present time on pulling together uh, the action plan and picking up the uh, points that the Secretary of State has requested information on. And we continue to update the local plan evidence base and we're commissioning the uh, technical studies that are required to support the submission of the local plan. Um, and all of that is in line with the National Planning Policy Framework and local plan uh, requirements. Uh, the Cabinet Member for Housing and Planning, Councillor George Davis, um, has written to uh, the two other party leaders in Wirral regarding the local plan across member advisory group. If you recall, that was discussed in detail at um, the call in that we recently had on the local plan. Uh, both of those leaders have accepted that invitation. We're now just organising um, the first meeting of that group and how that will then function and work in an advisory capacity to support the work of the local plan. Um, we will also be organising, as requested, uh, all member briefings on the local plan. So my colleague Kevin McCallum is taking the lead on this from the common side of things, and those will be scheduled in the near future. And following the elections in May, you know, when you have your briefings on various key topics, there'll be specifically one session on the local plan to obviously be members up to date uh, with those things um, as well. Uh, you may be aware that the government in the past couple of weeks have published two consultation responses. If you remember the end uh, of late last year, closing on the 7th of December, Government held a consultation on the household projection numbers. Um, government have now issued their uh, response to that, um, which is available on their website. Um, and I can send a link to members if you wish to look at that. What it effectively is saying um, is at the present time, the government's view is that the 2014 ONS projections are the ones that local authorities should continue to work with in terms of producing their local plan. Uh, the ONS projections that were published in September 2018, um, they have a number of issues with those, and they say they'll be consulting uh, on the standard methodology over the next 18 months. Uh, the second consultation response uh, was in relation to what's called the housing delivery test. Uh, so, in the latest revised version of the NPPF, there was a test introduced there in terms of how many houses you actually build and deliver in a year. And this is calculated each March. And um, depending on your performance in relation to that, there are various things that the Secretary of State requires you to do. For example, producing an action plan, there may be other sanctions and penalties if. Um, the required targets are not met. Um, now we've um, we've had the first uh, round of this. Our performance last year uh, was 73 percent. That means we need to produce an action plan by August to say how we are going to uh, improve housing delivery performance to hit the targets 
and I'll be bringing a report um, to members on uh, that um, fairly shortly. But you just need to be aware of those two uh, government responses because those are really important in terms of uh, the local plan and also housing delivery um, in Wirral. Um, just in terms of uh, resourcing and our capacity, uh, I'm pleased to say that we have now completed all the recruitment uh, for the additional support that members have agreed for the former planning team and over the next few weeks those five new posts that we've recruited will actually come in to support the work of the team uh, as we begin to move the plan forward. We can actually brief update and some of the chair um, in terms of the local plan. Thank you Dave and I'm much obliged. Does anyone have any questions? No? Move on. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, just one thing, David, on the um, cons that will be going in May for new members, will it be for just new members or existing members? Uh, my understanding is for all members to attend the new member session. Thank you, David. Okay, we move on to item 5, financial monitoring report 43. And I invite Pete Molyneux to come forward and give us a presentation today. Thank you, Peter. So, on this slide there, um, 
Overall trade was 580 pounds and spent a quarter of three point one six six million. I've just picked out the larger schemes there, just to kind of some of the larger schemes and we're up to on those. So big scheme eight eight in applications. That's a quarter three getting to one point five million pounds spent quarter three. I think basically it's kind of the at the moment. Okay, uh, another scheme there is KSM Centre, very improved. One that sticks out is landing from Chapel Road, you can see the Truth for Lancelot's the bottom, the budget was through £30,000, and then the quarter of the three, which meant £13,000. Uh, I've just checked today, the spend of the most about £150,000, so it's kind of a late scheme in the year, coming through, suspended from the etc. So I'm going to ask what that big picture was in the year. Okay, uh, so £3.166 million, after the fact that we take five five pounds and spend on, on capital. Uh, there has been a few during, during, during the third quarter, but before we start the year, we've got about £9.2 million on the programme. That's come down to about 5.8 million. So most of the schemes have been moved into 1920. So schemes have been reprofiled and moved into the 20 year. Uh, and those are talking about this. Some of those schemes have been saved in the field of course. And how some of the trips are managed to buy from the farm that have been moved into 1920. They'll still take place, but not in 1919. They'll be in 1920. And that's probably that's in some of the transition moments. Okay, thank you very much, Peter. Does anyone have any questions? Councillor Brown. Thank you, Chair, and, and thank you, Pete, for your uh, report. Um, I've got a couple of questions around the environment uh, spending, uh, uh, the revenue spending. Um, you have identified 1.4 million um, that efficiency savings that has not been realised in waste and environment. And then also 0.2 million about uh, where we didn't raise enough income from garden waste. Um, are we making progress? Or could we have a bit more detail about what those efficiency savings were, why they weren't achieved, and are they going to have any impact on next year's budget? And, and similarly, the waste, um, you know, are we assuming we're going to generate more income next year, or is that just unrealistic? It's too much there's a point about the shortfall in terms of different contract. I'd like to know say we try to negotiate with the better suits on returns. Um <coughs> think the next year that'll be a good balance of the budget because it's kind of not 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 been achieved. So for, for, for the 1920 budget that would be a good back in I've been on these Being waste at the other side is is the green waste but I think it's about three thousand pounds increase in green waste. Um, we've achieved hundred thousand pounds of that, but there's a two hundred thousand pounds shortfall. On, on that, that target. Uh, I think that there's some sort of plans and everything to market again, etc. Try to achieve that over the year, it's my understanding. Thank you, Councillor Faust. Thank you, yeah, yes, Chair, yeah, thank you. Um, I think there's, there's some, what we say, more clarification needed around the capital programme. Now, those who have been around a while are quite familiar that capital programmes don't always spend in a year. And I think what members may need some reassurance about is when you use the word reprofiling, is that the scheme that they were originally allocated for in the programme of, of 18-19, that rolls over and the reprofiling means that it's going to get done at a different time, but the, the scheme stays the same. Because I think you know, people do get frustrated, they see the capital programme, oh we're going to get X, Y and Z you know, done, done up or, or, or made better. And it doesn't happen for a lot of technical reasons. And I think members just need to have some assurance that, that the, the schemes that they thought would agree that we wanted to carry on will be progressed, but only at a later date. And I know there's a whole host of new schemes now coming in the 19, 1920 programme, which we will begin to monitor next year. Just, just wanted members to be reassured about that, that, those statements. It's kind of fact that that's correct. When there's a new profile, schemes are being moved next year. They're not being deleted. They're being moved into the following year. And occasionally, schemes are brought forward as well. They can make the way some time. Yeah, okay. Councillor Ellis. Thank you, John. Just a quick one. Peter, you may not know the answer to this, but you'll tell me, John. At the West Coast scheme, which you mentioned, um, I see it's grossly underspent. Now, I know the reason that is because they haven't done it yet, but there is a great big notice on the site saying it's going to open in the early spring 2019, but they haven't even finished the foundations yet. Would you, would you and your department know, has that been pulled ahead? Uh, 
This is a snapshot of the current smoking facts in the world. So, as Julie said, we still have over 40,000 smokers in the world, the adult population. And we see that as twice uh, more likely in our impact areas. So, as Julie mentioned, men is one of our key contributors to health inequalities. However, we do know, both from national and local data, that the majority of smokers do not quit. It's just making sure that that support is there and is tailored, is tailored for their needs. There is a cost associated to smoking that goes across the system, and we still see one in eight of our pregnant women smoking at the time of delivery. Um, and then the rest of those factors there look at the fact that one in four for young smokers can be offered an um, even list of tobacco, and we do some work with trading standards around that. And some stats on smoke-free areas, which was from the National <coughs> Survey. So that just really gives you a snapshot of, of where we're at at the moment in the world. So the key actions that sit within the strategy is it stands. And the strategy was put together in 2015, and it finishes next year. And it was put together based on local insight from um, local folks, but also aligned with the National Tobacco Strategy, the National Plan at that time. And the report will give you the detail that sits under each of these titles here. So our four key areas that we work around is ensuring that the risks associated with smoking are well publicised, and that's throughout the whole of the system, looking at making sure that we have um, a comprehensive stop smoking service in situ called ABF Health, and also uh, making sure that we have those referral pathways what we're able to flag the service so you can sell it there. Having healthy smoking environments is really important around nudging that culture change and it's something we've done a lot of work with leisure in our parks and gardens. And we need an, an illicit tobacco activity that's still very prevalent. There's a lot of myth busting that we still have to do around um, the crime that's associated with the legal illicit tobacco, working with our local trading standards to work on local intel so we can act on that. So there's a lot of work that happens behind the scenes, so it's not all about having a local stop smoking service. It's about, as a system, what do we do to raise the profile of tobacco control and smoking cessation. So in 2018, we um, invited um, a company called Adpacking to come and do a clear review. And the clear review looks at our delivery plans to our tobacco control. And the team act as a critical, critical friend, really. And they explore under those headings and against the National Tobacco Control Plan where we're at. So there is a list of recommendations that you will see in the main report, but these are some of the key, the key ones that we picked out. So absolutely it's around tobacco control and smoking cessation being everyone's business. Um, how do we ensure that we have a wider partnership to help us refresh, refresh, not refresh, refresh the action plan? which is due um, next year, and how do we really work with our local communities and how do we advocate <laughs> clean, smoke-free environments? How do we frame, reframe those messages around smoking cessation? How do we ensure that tobacco control is embedded as business as usual? And absolutely, our NHS needs, by example, to, um, is a smoke-free NHS. And lastly, it's around how do we build that consensus across both our council, council functions and the wider system around tobacco control? Where are our advocates? Where can we really scale up those messages around smoking cessation? So what, what are our leaders going forward? As you're aware, the NHS long-term plan has been published and in there it gives three very clear, distinct categories around smoking NHS, smoking pregnancy, around support for people with mental health problems. So as a system, how do we work through those priorities and make sure that we've got what is right for our key population groups and need the most support? As Julie mentioned before, we've got a good plan. And our tobacco control strategy is embedded within our um, rural residents living healthier lives. But again, what does that look like in the refresh? Are we gonna, is there going to be a strong enough message there around tobacco control? And we really need to keep it on the agenda. And then, of course, we've got we're all together. So that's how we change the conversation with our local communities. Again, how do we culture nudge? How do we advocate those local environments? 
how do we advocate for people to take better care of themselves, to look after themselves, and really embrace the self-care agenda? So I guess some key questions really, and I suppose thinking about it in the context of an environment, how can we encourage clean and healthy environments? How can we ensure there's a focus on our children and young people's settings? How do we influence what's happening within our local economy, and our local businesses, around smoke-free sites? And how do we make sure that we have tobacco control and smoking cessation clearly embedded within any regen and development plans that we have across the world? And how do we make smoking history for our children? Thank you. Okay, thanks very much indeed. Before we go to any questions, I've just been rereading the recommendations in the report, and you've set yourselves some really aspirational and challenging recommendations. And I think it's beholden on me on behalf of the committee to wish you all the very best to achieve. <laughs> questions? Councillor Kenny. Yeah. Thank you, Chair. One of the things that's always shocked me ever since I became a councillor was the facts that show that people who are born on the east side of the world tend to die, I think it's 12 or 13 years before people on the west side. Coming on to the particular issue of smoking, have you done any research to show whether people in different parts of the world are more vulnerable to this because of the, the smoking issue? Thank you. Yes, Councillor, and it, yeah, unfortunately yeah, our smoking rates are much higher than the east side of the borough. I think it's one of the main drivers of the inequalities that we've got. So um, some of the challenges uh, that we have is how do we have a, a different offer, a different conversation with people who live down the east side of the borough? And what's the offer that, that they're looking for from the service? Earlier this week on Monday, we had a meeting around the stop smoking service and the uh, the offer that they can give to people around helping them to stop, to help them to quit. And one of the things that we're looking at, well, that they are actually, is an e-cigarette friendly service. So we know that a lot of people are using e-cigarettes to stop quitting, and particularly we see that in the east side of the borough, and it's um, how can we offer additional support based on the behaviour that we're seeing in that part of the borough compared to, compared to other parts. So I think it's constantly, and Becky mentioned, uh, we're all together before, it's constantly, I think, now, trying to shift the service, particularly around the smoking cessation service, and have that different conversation. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Chair. Councillor Benny, Councillor Moss Pratt, and then Councillor Bray. Thank you, Chair. Uh, thanks very much for the presentation. Um, one of the bullet points that you have was um, creating healthy, smoke-free environments. And on page 40, the very last bullet point is that uh, the development of regeneration plans to include smoke-free parks, by areas, high streets, areas of beaches and country parks, NHS sites and council sites. And I welcome that as a non-smoker policy, I welcome that, and most people will. But I'd like to know, how you intend to, to achieve that when we've got people who will, will, will talk about civil liberties, human rights, I and mean, we tried to ban dogs from the pictures and it didn't work because people say, you know, it's an infringement. And as I say, I welcome all of them, I'd like to see it happen, but, ha you know, it's a massive, massive chore. Can you tell me how you intend to go about it? Absolutely, it's very aspirational. We've got to aim high. We're going to make smoking history for our children. I think it's about working where the energy is. I think it's around working with our partners across the system where we know we can make a difference and we have an open door to push on. And almost pointing it's that much environment, isn't it? So if we can create almost a ground swell around smoke free environments, it's a bit like um, the kind of broken window syndrome. You've got those rolling broken windows, it's a much better place. So I think in answer to your question, there's no um, defined plan at the moment. I think we have to understand what our system looks like and where we can put our energies first and work through it that way. Can I just add to that? Because I've, I've been in public health a long time now, and um, it, is, it is pushing a great big boulder uphill, and sometimes you do end up 
going backwards before we go forwards again. Perhaps if there's a, an error in the report, because in 1997 the smoking legislation was introduced, I never thought I'd see anything like that in my working career. And that was a big step forward. So I suppose it's something along the, it's, it's keeping the aspiration and also looking, as Becky says, for where can we just launch things along all the time. So the smoking legislation, I believe, a lot of that's been successful because those non-smokers became angry. It was always about the rights of the smokers. And in some respects, I quite like to see non-smokers angry again about their rights to have clean air. Absolutely valid, valid, very valid point. We need to make sure that prevention is very, very strong. 